Welcome to our online service. We are so glad to have you with us. My name is Nathan and I'm the lead pastor here at Orange Baptist Church. We would love to keep blessing you and one of the key ways you can partner with us is by sharing and liking and subscribing to this channel uh, and sharing this content through a whole multitude of platforms uh, so that we might see other people blessed in the good news of Jesus. Another key way of partnering with us is that if you are blessed by this, that you might consider partnering with us financially here uh, at the work of Orange Baptist Church. And then one of the key ways to do that is through our online giving platform and the details for that are below in the description. We wanna be praying for you and we want you to connect with us. So if you need prayer at any point along the way, please shoot us an email at prayer at orangebaptistchurch.org.au and a team of people are waiting to pray with you and for you. And if you are ever in the local vicinity of Orange in New South Wales, please drop in, come and see us on a Sunday morning. We would love to worship with you and to celebrate Jesus together. Be blessed.
Lord God, our Heavenly Father, as it is written in Psalm 139, you have searched us and you know us. You know when we sit and when we rise, when we go out or when we lay down. You are familiar with all our ways. Before a word is on our tongue, you know what we will say. You surround us. You are behind us and before us. Your knowledge is too wonderful for us, too lofty for us to comprehend. There is nowhere we can go that is so far away that you would not be with us. Your hand holds us fast. You guide us. Nothing can hide us from where, from, sorry, nothing can hide, hide us from you and where you are there is light and not darkness. Even before we were conceived, you saw us and knew us. You know the days we are to walk this earth. They are written in your book. We worship and adore you, Lord. We thank you that our life with you is secure in Jesus and that your Holy Spirit is with us. Lord, we pray for ourselves that which Paul prayed for the Colossians. We ask that you would fill us with the knowledge of your will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We pray that we may live lives worthy of you, pleasing to you in every way. We ask that we would bear fruit in every good work and grow in the knowledge of God, to be strengthened with all power according to your glorious might so that we might have great endurance and patience joyfully giving thanks to you, Father. We thank you that in Christ we share in the inheritance of the saints in your kingdom of light, having been rescued by Jesus from the dominion of darkness, redeemed and forgiven of sin. Father, we remember those we partner with through the missionary committee, those whose names and work appear on the slides up on the screen before each service. We ask for health and strength, wisdom and guidance and protection, for opportunity to speak of Jesus and for receptive hearts to your good news. Bless each of these families and do a mighty work through them. Father, for the family of faith here at Orange Baptist Church, we pray for our health needs, our spiritual, mental and physical health. For those afflicted in any way, we ask for healing, whether that is through an instant of divine unction or a slower recovery. However it comes, you alone are our healer and to you alone do we assign praise. But at the same time, we are incredibly thankful to you for all those employed in the medical field who bless us with their service. For those undertaking medical procedures or treatments this week, we ask for your healing touch and the knowledge of your close presence. As we contemplate the complexities of our total health, may we always be filled with faith in our all-sufficient God and never walk in fear. You have us in the palm of your hand both here in this life and on into eternity. Finally, we bring before you Pastor Gary, who has been unwell. We praise you for the healing you have been doing in his body and we continue to ask for his complete healing and return to health and strength as he recovers over the next few weeks. We thank you, Father. Amen. I'm going to be reading for us this morning from Romans 13, if you'd like to open your Bibles. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, 
For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, who give their, who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honour, then honour. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever, whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Lord, your word is true and it is there for your glory and for our good as we live in light of the gospel um, help me, Lord, to unpack Romans 13 in a way that is pleasing and honourable to you. Help us, Lord, by your spirit to have our hearts softened, uh, that we would be humbled in this passage uh, and that we would see your systems for this world and that we would live faithfully in light of that, uh, that we would live faithfully before you that our endeavours and our thoughts and our actions uh, would be out of this process of being living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you. Lord, help us in this time, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. When I was a kid, <clears throat> my parents taught me many things, one of which was never talk about politics and money. So I thought we'd do that today and talk about politics and money. Uh, Romans 13 has a huge amount for us to say. Now, by which I mean uh, politics, when, when I, I don't care if you, how you vote, that's not the intent here. But what I would say is no matter which way you vote, um, Romans 13 is still very true uh, and is something for us to take hold of in the midst of that. We're not going to kind of find ourselves in certain southern parts of a certain nation in the Northern Hemisphere where we're going to crucify one another for our political beliefs. That's not what this is uh, because when we read Romans 13, and, and Laura has already done that for us, uh, what do we see? We see that God has set up governance, uh, human governance and order, uh, but we can't miss the fact that above that is God himself. Yeah. So our response to how we live in this life uh, takes us back into chapter 12. Yeah, so this is a continuum. It makes sense, right? We're in chapter 13, so you have to read it in light of chapter 12. And chapter 12 has been at pains to talk about Romans 1 to 11, which is in light of God's goodness, in light of his gospel, his redemption, in light of all of the blessings that we receive in Christ, we now are to live differently. That we are to live not as conformed by the pattern of the world, but transformed in the renewing of our minds around God and his word and in our actions. And we are to live faithfully for him now and his glory in his world. That means that we have to then find ourselves submissive to the structures and the ordinances that God himself has put into place, even when we don't necessarily like it. And Romans 13, in light of what I've just said, begins with this. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, 
Whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Ah, it's, it's really challenging. The first sentence is, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except which God has established. This is kind of shocking to us and we kind of go, oh, yeah, but only within reason or certainly for only a period of four years in our context or a few years ago every six weeks and then we get a new one and then we decide whether we like them or not and that for depends upon whether we should follow them or not. So if they scratch our itch, then sure, okay, we're okay with that. But if they don't, well, that's a bit more of a challenge. Paul makes this kind of abundantly clear that we don't get to play that game. In fact, all of the subject, not only are we to be subjected towards our governments, but when you look at this, it's not just as if it's the Prime Minister. So the governance structure that Paul is talking about here, it's not just, in this instance, Caesar. This isn't just for us in our context, the Prime Minister, but actually it's about every level of governance that we find ourselves under. So that, that means for us in our context, our national uh, government and our state government and our local government and, and, and even, whew, it's just so hard, the police force, particularly the highway patrol units. Um, we, yeah. But we have to. This is what we're called to. We're called to live as subjects humbled before these government authorities. And we look at it and go, well, it's not too bad by and large, but this is, you know, still not comfortable in lots of ways. Consider it for the first hearers of this. Consider it for the Roman church just for a moment. Consider that at the very time of, of receiving this, Nero was, the emperor Nero was just coming into power. And Nero, well, he was an amazing emperor in so many ways, loved to hold parties at night time and would have all manner of torches that would light up his courtyard. Generally, live Christians doused in petrol and set on flames. So you think about that, you think about the, the incredible persecution that the, the, the Christians in Rome were facing, you consider the, the immense pressure to conform to the patterns of the world around them, considering that Caesar not only was kind of a ruler at that point, but was actually seen to either be God or so aligned with God that anything against him was treason. So this wasn't just under a kind of a comfortable democracy in which we determine how this is going to play itself out depending upon populace and, you know, like, you know, trying to get a school captain and on popularity vote. This was written to a church under immense pressure. And Paul still calls for them to be subject to the governing authorities. And why? Why? Because that is how God has established it. So in them being, as well as for us being subjected to governing authorities, we are to be humbled and submissive before them because it is God who has put them in their place. Are you with me? Which is why he says this, the authorities that exist have been established by God. So consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and those who do so will bring judgment upon themselves. And again, this isn't dependent upon whether you like them or not. Yeah, this is, this is hard, like in practice, this is incredibly difficult. But there is this theological understanding that God is the one who has established these governing principles. He has set up governance structures. God is the one who raises and falls kings and kingdoms. Yeah? And so when we see the government that is put into place, they were put into place, God's system was that they would rule well. But what happens when they don't? Does the command then go thrown out the window? Not at all. Not at all. Because it is still God who raised them up. And we see this so clearly. 
not just in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament. And we see this here with Daniel. Uh, we take back to Daniel. So Daniel is uh, a man of great stature within the, uh, within the, uh, the nation of Israel. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, who is a total sociopath and narcissist at every point along the way. Uh, I actually was at a, I went a few years ago down to Melbourne uh, to see a Babylonian um, kind of exhibition at one of the museums there. And there was writings of uh, Nebuchadnezzar himself that he had inscribed into tablets. And to say that he thought highly of himself would be a gross understatement. He, He thought so highly of himself at every point along the way. And so he has come in, he's sacked Israel, he's sacked Jerusalem, he's taken the very best and he's making sure that he is setting himself up in control. And this context here is he's had some dreams that are a bit trippy and he doesn't know how to respond to them and Daniel comes in and does very much that. Here, Daniel makes it abundantly clear in the face of this man who thinks so highly of himself, again is narcissistic and a sociopath at every point along the way, notice what Daniel Daniel says, he says this, praise be to the name of God forever and ever, wisdom and power are his. So he starts with a praise and why? He changes times and season, he deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. God is the one who has established the system of governance and God is the one who raises them up and deposes them, which is incredibly difficult if you are under huge amounts of persecution. But it doesn't change the fact that God is sovereign and he is in control. And because he is sovereign and he is in control, how we live before man matters. And it matters because we've been redeemed. And as redeemed people, we now no longer live for ourselves, but we now live as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, because this is our act of worship. So in a sense, when we are subjected to authority and we obey, we are worshipping God. And that's incredibly difficult, particularly, as I said, for me. It's complex, I get it, because we can't help but look and go, but I want to look at all the negative things. I want to look at all the challenging things. Well, we'll we'll get to that. But let's unpack this a little bit further and see why God has established this governance when it works well and it's supposed to work well. Yeah, we see it first off. Uh, We are to obey in light of this because God himself has instituted this, for sure. Uh, But then we jump into chapter uh, verse 2 to verse 4, and what else do we see? Consequently, whoever rebels against the authorities, rebelling against God and his institution, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right. But for those who do wrong... Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Well, the answer is obviously yes. Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid for the rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants against uh, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. At the end of the day, what we see is, is that actually in God's governance system, uh, he set it up, there's actual, there's some goodness in this, right? So when it works really well and we behave ourselves, then there's good things that come, right? We don't like governance and, and we don't like to submit ourselves to those things and often that is the difficulty when we do wrong. And when we do wrong, we then are punished in accordance, generally by a man in blue with lights flashing on the highway who says, good afternoon, driver. And you, through gritted teeth, say, good afternoon, officer. I know that statement off by heart. 
And then he smiles and hands you a piece of paper and says, have a good day. And internally, or externally, you say, you too, officer. And internally, you're like, and I hope that your cat dies. <laughs> like, what happens is the governance room, we don't like when we don't do the right thing. But God's system in setting it up is if, if it does well, then everyone prospers. Yeah? And if we just obey, by which I'm talking not just obey the governance of the, the law, uh, but we obey Christ. We live out the gospel in our functions in our daily lives and that enables us to live faithfully in the world around us, which means that we won't fall into error. And when we do fall into error, there is punishment that comes. Now, I, I kind of talk about the, the, the challenges of, uh, uh, of, you know, driving and the difficulties of that, but uh, by and large, we actually love this system it's a system of justice, right? And we want to live in a society where there is justice, particularly for those who do wrong. And not just ourselves, but there are good systems that are put into place. We have speed limits because we don't want to crash and kill ourselves or other people. Yeah? When someone hurts children, we want justice, don't we? I want justice. Absolutely. When people hurt other people, when people abuse the system, we want justice. And if we live faithfully, then we don't have to worry about the hand that will hit us because there's nothing, there's no reason for us to feel the wrath of the government. This is the nature in which God has established. And it's difficult, but the end result is if there was no structure around this and everyone just did as they pleased, where would we be? I'll tell you where we'll be. We'll be back in the time of Judges. And in Judges, we see that at that time, they did not have God. They had no governance over them. Everyone did as they pleased and it went to hell in a handbasket. And what we see is this multitude of murder and rape and the likes that take place across all of Israel. There's, uh, there's absolute domestic violence. There's, uh, uh, there's uh, abuse at every level. And that's what it looks like when there is no structure about, uh, over it and God removes his, half of his foot. We live in a time where, the, by and large, we live in a very safe environment. We do. And according to that is because there is governance and systems that are put into place to protect us. And that is a display of God's grace and goodness. And when we submit to that and we live faithfully, there's no problems. But when we do wrong, there is punishment. There is punishment. When it works well, there is real wisdom here. But more than that, there is also fairness that comes. Let's, let's take a look here uh, in Romans 5, Romans 13 from verse 5. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to authorities not only because of possible punishments but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay your taxes for the authorities of God's servant who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, this, we're talking about the government here, we're talking about every level of governance, including the police here, that we are to give in everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay your taxes. If it is revenue, then revenue. If it is... I'll get there, I'll get there. Respect and oh, honour. And honor. I joke, but that's what we're to give, respect and honour. And this is good. We pay what we owe. We pay our taxes. Why do we pay our taxes? So that we all benefit. When there is a system of governance that is being faithfully administered, when we pay our taxes, it is to the betterment of all of us. So why wouldn't you pay your taxes? We spend so much of our time trying to avoid tax and no one likes paying tax, but everyone loves the benefits of paying tax, don't we? 
It's just a total thing. It's like, I don't like paying tax. I'm going to try and rot the system as best we can. But gee, I'm unhappy about the roads. I don't like paying tax. We're going to kind of move our businesses and structure our business so we pay as less amount of tax as we possibly can. But if I'm not seen by a doctor within 35 seconds, I'm going to absolutely stab someone with a spoon because it hurts more. I don't want to pay my taxes, but I want my kids to be educated. This, this is the reality. In God's system, there is a whole bunch of things that are set up for the betterment of a whole. And this isn't just found here in the New Testament. When you go back and you look at the laws in Deuteronomy and in Leviticus, they are set up for the benefit of everyone. Now, there's some stuff that we struggle to understand because it's contextually way outside the box. But at the heart of that is to make sure that even the least of the people Make sure that they are fed, clothed and cared for. And why? Because all people are made in the image of God and all of them are loved and treasured by God. That each one of us are of value and have worth. And so in that, the systems that God has established is so that everyone would benefit The problem is is there's difficulty here for us because we live in a time where when it's pretty good here but we know of other nations where there is great, great difficulty in these things because of corruption and the likes. Yeah, that's awful. That is not the way that God has established it. That's not the way that people should administer in their governance. But even in the midst of that, it doesn't excuse how we live. Because remembering that above all of our governance is God himself. And our worship and our submission is to God. Are you with me? And so even in that, we are to show honour and respect to our political leaders, to every level of governance. And again, that can be difficult. I find that really difficult. I take great delight in mocking political leaders. I I think it's funny. But here we have to show honour and respect because when done well, we all benefit from it. Are are you with me? Now, we, we unpack this and we get to this and you go, okay, this is, this is all right. I, I can appreciate what God is saying here. But what about? That's straight away where we go. But what about? Now, I have two things to say about that. When we often go, but what about, it's because we're trying to find a clause out. Right? That's what we're doing. We're trying to find a clause out. So if we want to know, well, how far can I go in my obedience so that I don't have to go all the way? So where is the tension points? And at this point, no matter how black and white you are, you find yourself delighting and basking in the grey. And however dark or light the grey is, is determined upon whether you are a goody two-shoes or you're a little bit more like where you're trying to take things on a liberal stance. Either way, we don't get to play that game. There is, however, times for us as Christians, where we would not find ourselves being civilly obedient to the government. So what are they? Well, sorry, but it has got nothing to do with tax law. It's got nothing to do with your investment portfolio or your superannuation or your retirement structures. It's got nothing to do with the way that the whole system works around homes and the likes. It's got everything to do with our worship of God, okay? Because remember who is above our governance structures. It's God himself. We give to Caesar what's Caesar's and we give to God what's God's, which is exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 22, 17 to 21. Tell us then what is your opinion. This is the, this is the Sanhedrin trying to trap Jesus. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? So again, we're trying to establish how far can I go? What's right, what's wrong? And Jesus responded, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They bought him a denarius 
And he said, he asked them, whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. In other words, take care of your civil liberties. Take care of the civil responsibilities that are in place. But not at the expense of our worship to God. Because our obedience, our allegiance, our hearts, our lives, our very being is for the glory of God. And we know that there are lots of governance structures, including here in Australia, that don't and are not compatible with worshipping God and following God's statutes. Are you with me? And this is where it gets really difficult. We've got to try and work this out together. So what is it? What are those things in which we can find ourselves in civil disobedience? Well, I think the book of Daniel has a heck of a lot to say to us in this, a real lot. And again, why? Because as I said, Nebuchadnezzar had come and taken all of the top elite out of Israel and had taken them into Babylon for what purpose? One, so there's no uprising, so they don't have to have another fight on another front, and two, so that you just bring in assimilation. Yeah, so you take the best of the best and you have them work for you now. And what's interesting here in this context in Daniel 6, this is after Daniel has already put Nebuchadnezzar in his place. Now, as he's now rising through the ranks, we have some other people who now want to undermine Daniel. And they do this by playing into Nebuchadnezzar's heart, which is for Nebuchadnezzar. And this is what we see. And we'll jump down here into verse 7. There was an uh, issue an edict and enforced the decree that anyone who prays to any God or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Did you see this? There's a decree that comes that says, we're going to ban the worship of God and prayer for, uh, for everyone, except only to you, king. And anyone who disobeys, will be faced with death. And this is how Daniel responds. So Daniel, in verse 10, learned that the decree had been published. He went home to his upstairs room where the window opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Did you see this? This is holy civil disobedience. This is the one where Daniel is told, you will not worship your God. You will only bow your knee to the king in charge. And Daniel goes, no, I'm not playing that game. In fact, it's not as if he even tries to hide the fact. Daniel doesn't just go home, go upstairs and find himself, closes the windows and draws all the curtains, goes into his cupboard and prays, Lord, please don't let them find me and please don't let them find out that I'm praying to you so that I end up getting murdered. He doesn't do it out of fear. What does he do? No, he goes and he opens up the window towards Jerusalem to the faithfulness of God, to the desire for God to act. And he opens his up his windows so Everyone can see. And then what does he do? Praise. Three times a day. And in that, he prays, giving thanks to his God. He gives thanks even in the face of persecution. Thanks. He's not asking for the circumstances to change. He's just asking for faithfulness in the midst of this. He just worships and praises God. And he does so in the face of civil constraints because his obedience lies with God and not with man. Are you with me? And what's interesting, he does it even in the face knowing that he would die. And we know the story. If you've been in church long enough and if you've been in kids' ministry at any point along the way, you know that God saves Daniel from the lion's den. But that's not the miraculous part of the story. And you know why it's not miraculous? Because God does that all the time. God is so faithful. He's so powerful. Of course he can shut the mouths of lions. The miracle is that you have a man under huge persecution, huge tension, who holds faithfully to God. That's what you have. You haven't got someone who's trying to manipulate the system and find the loophole. 
You've got it very clear. He goes, no, my allegiance is to God and to him alone. So when our allegiance is being called into question and we are asked, when we are told, when we are directed not to worship God, not to hold the name of Jesus, we walk into willfully civil disobedience because we have our holy obedience to our maker, our sustainer, our saviour, our king. Are you with me? Now, this is super important then. I'm trying to work out what that means for us. And this would have been maybe helpful for us to have preached through Romans 13, let's say, two years ago. Because contrary to belief, when the government were instituting these commands, they weren't doing so to stop us from worshipping Jesus. Yeah? They weren't. In fact, the decisions, whether we agree or disagree with the vast majority of the government decisions, do you know they actually were trying to do it for everyone's best and not just our individual best? I know that's crazy, right? Like out of 26 million people, how come the government aren't making decisions based on what I want? You know, what's best for me as an individual or even for us as a little collective? Because, again, God has established a system where it is for the whole good, yes, the whole good based on the best information they've got. And never once did the government try to stop us from worshipping Jesus. Not once. And let me say that even as a leadership, when these rules were coming out, we were having to work with these and pray through these and there were decisions and we had lines in the sand that if the government went to this point, that we as a leadership would walk into civil disobedience because that would be contrasting to God's word. Yeah? Yeah? And we've got to be careful here because what happens is, is we end up with two different types of systems here. One, where we start to think that any kind of restriction that is placed upon us, they're trying to restrict us from worshipping Jesus. And so we panic. And so then we just kind of fight at every point along the way. Or what happens is, is we're so afraid to be wrong because, because not, we have more fear of man and the systems than we do of God and so we just take it on holy and solely and we don't even question. There has to be a place. More than this, there are other reasons where we would move into holy disobedience. And we see this in Acts chapter 5 and the proclamation of the gospel. Here again, what we have is the apostles who have gone out and to proclaim the good news. They're preaching the gospel. They're telling people of Jesus. And in preaching this, they get imprisoned. And the story goes, and we've read it before, that at that point the angels come and they open up the cell doors and they are flung out and these guys walk out and what do they do? As soon as they are arrested and imprisoned for preaching the gospel, they're released, what do they do? Go straight back out to the courts and start preaching the gospel there again. And this is how this plays out. So they're arrested a second time and the Sanhedrin arrest them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings and are determined to make us guilty for this man's blood. (laughs) That's right, because you are. And then Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God and not human beings. This is about our faithfulness to God and we have been told to make disciples and to preach the good news and we won't stop doing that and that for the simple reason is because our God is sovereign and our God redeems and restores. Are you with me? Our God redeems and restores and we want that for the world and I will not stop preaching the gospel And I hope that you won't either. These are the things that we are told that are absolutely vital for us. So what do we do then? What do we do in all of this? Well, there are going to be other times for us in which we are going to have to continue to stand and advocate for the things of the gospel, for the things of the kingdom of God, even in the face of, well, the laws around us. 
So for us as Christians, we have to have our brains switched on a little bit. There are going to be times where the government institutes things that we're going to be advocates against, that we're going to raise our voice as citizens of this world, because we are. And so we have a voice. And using our voice in ways that are constructive and helpful don't undermine what God has said. But there are going to be elements in which we are going to walk and fight for. Maybe put pressure on is a better word than fight. But things around right to live, right to life. We know that every life is beautiful and is given by God. And I know that there are some complexities and there's some ethical quandaries in the midst of all of this. But there's going to be decisions that there are people here in our community of faith that are going to have to walk and navigate in the world in which they live. They're going to have to make decisions around abortions and uh, the end of life treatment. That's going to be a reality and we advocate for what is good as Christians and as citizens of this world advocating for the things that God And so we're going to advocate for the right to life. We're going to advocate for the refugees because everyone has value and everyone has purpose. And again, our systems and our structures were so that all people would be welcomed, that all people would be provided for and cared for and that they would be protected. We we know throughout all the entirety of the scriptures that we are to bless the least of these. We're to give voice to the voiceless. We need to give hope to the hopeless. So as Christians, we can't stay silent on these issues. We're going to advocate for them and we're going to live faithfully in the midst of them. Again, for the poor and the marginalised, we're going to take care, we're going to work hard at caring for those. We're going to fight against domestic violence. We're going to fight against oppression at every point along the way. We're going to do so because that is not the picture of the kingdom of God. That is not the desire of the king who has established these governments. And again, it's somewhat easier for us in our context because if we don't like what's taking place, we get a chance to vote again in a few years. But again, there is brothers and sisters all around the world that are facing real senses of persecution and are being told not to worship God, that are being told to abandon the gospel. And we need to stand with them and to be praying with them. And more than that, we are also to be praying for these governments. That's why here in 1 Timothy 2, we are given these clear commands. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers and intercession and and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and those in authorities, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. There's two things here that we're to do. We're to advocate and we're to pray for those in charge. We're to pray for wisdom and discernment for them, that they might hear and understand that God is the one who is over them and that there is a system that God has established for the better of all people, right? But there's also a prayer for ourselves, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives that is centred in godliness and holiness so that we live obedience to Christ in this system of the world because we know that our king reigns and, as we'll see in Romans 13 next week in the second half, is that God is coming again. So how we live actually matters. There is bounds in which we will walk into civil disobedience, but we need to be wise about what they are and we need to be truthful about what they are and we need to be clear on what they are and what they aren't. But we are called to be faithful because as we do so, it's for the glory of God. Yep, he is our king. He is our ruler. And so we have to ask ourselves, how are we going at living in this world? Are we good citizens? Are we showing honour and respect to our leaders? Are we living out of the decisions that a government made for the betterment of all? We can disagree, but we can't fully reject. We can't fight against unless, of course, they are calling for us to abandon Christ and to stop preaching his gospel. 
and we use all means necessary to continue to advocate for his kingdom in this world. Is that clear? I know it's, it's not fun, but if we had to live for the glory of Christ, then these are the practical things that Paul gives us to teach us to live faithfully in the world. So don't avoid your taxes. Don't play the selfish game. Don't abuse the systems. Pay your fines. Don't speed. (laughs) I'm going to try and put my cruise control on way more. That's what we need to do because we're doing it for the glory of God. Amen? Let me pray. Lord, help us by your mercy to live out your command for for us to be living sacrifices. Help us, Lord, to live ways that are pleasing to you in true worship. Lord, help us not to be conformed to the patterns of the world, but, Lord, that we would be transformed, that we would be transformed in your gospel, that we would live in light of your gospel, that we would be faithful citizens here on earth, that we would live radical lives marked in peace and love and concern, that we would display your glory at every point along the way. Lord, help us to honour those who are in charge. Lord, we recognise that you are the one who has raised them up. So we ask, Lord, that you would bless them with great wisdom and discernment so that they might govern appropriately they might govern with equity and with grace and with mercy so that all of us might benefit. More than that, Lord, help us, Lord, to be faithful to you. And if there is a time that comes, Lord, where we must stand for you, by your spirit would you strengthen us that we might stand faithfully to you that we might not fall into the patterns of the world. And we so we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who are facing immense persecution, who are under tyrants, who want to remove people uh, who worship you. Lord, we want to pray against those governments who want to destroy your church. We pray for our brothers and sisters that they may endure, that they might live faithfully, that they might hold on to the truth that they may never stop preaching the gospel, that true liberation would be, would be given as you use them. Lord, help us here to be a community of faith that lives out of holiness and godliness at every point. In the name of Jesus, amen.